Thanks for joining us. Um, this was meant to be a real talk in the exhibition space, but um, because we can't do that, we're going to give you a very brief 20 minute walk through the show. This is our first ever survey exhibition, uh, spread over 15 rooms and includes over 46 different works, I think. So um, in 20 minutes, we can't cover all of this. So we'll just go very briefly over a few kind of key works and a few recurring themes in our practice. So one of the first works when walking into the exhibition is a series of neon sculptures that all are um, reconstructions of the steel structures within historical taxidermy of birds of paradise. Now these birds were collected by Wallace. Russell Wallace. Russell Wallace. In Indonesia. And um, by recreating the steel structures the taxidermists built within them, we were looking for the sort of human touch within what we perceive to be natural history. So our work often looks into animal bodies as uh, forms that are created by human intervention, imagination, fantasy, belief, and so on. So we work with a lot of species that are more designed and created than they perhaps appear to be. Um, so the room just next to it shows one of these new bodies of work looking into a very particular animal which kind of fits this description and this is the thoroughbred racehorse. So the panels that you see and also see behind us in the studio now are powder coated and powder coating is an industrial process designed to cover metals. And historically powder coating used bone ash, the ashes of mostly cows and other animals, just as bone ash is still used in a lot of ceramic processes nowadays, bone china. Um, so to make these works we uh, got hold of the ashes of a thoroughbred racehorse and we approached a factory that produces powder coating powder to make us our own bespoke uh, formula that uses the ashes of the racehorse. And um, we asked them to make the powder that can mimic a very particular horse coat called the Blue Roan, and that is made out of 50% uh, white hair and 50% black, which somehow together appear blue. And um, this powder is then applied onto steel and aluminium. So we, so we see these metal panels as a form of horse portraits, the portraits of thoroughbred racehorses but in a material way, and not in a figurative way. And that's relevant to us because historically, the thoroughbred racehorse is an animal that can only exist within this economy and ecology of gambling. And it, it dates back hundreds of years. And throughout history, the thoroughbred racehorse has in some way been advertised, supported by an art history of paintings. If we think of the thoroughbred paintings of George Stubbs, they were, in some way, an early forms of brand management of the thoroughbred racehorse. And therefore of the English Empire. We arrived at the body of the thoroughbred racehorse by looking at gambling. We were really interested in gambling as almost the contemporary condition. The central question of why do we subscribe ourselves to conditions we lose from in the long term? perhaps related to increasing inequality um, and for sure related to a very sophisticated psychology of luring us into these conditions of gambling. The main work in this new body of works is a film called The Odds, Part 1. And the film is made out of three parts. The first one um, revolves around these three showgirl dancers that used to dance in Sands Casino in Macau a casino that belongs to the world's biggest political donor. And they were part of a dance troupe called the Sand Sirens. And uh, in the film they are dancing and also talking about the difference between art and entertainment, um, their view of the world, their hopes, their dreams. Um, the second part of the film looks again into these thoroughbred racehorses as they are anesthetized on ketamine in a hospital preparing for surgery. And in this moment where the horses uh, become, become anesthetized, they become almost sculptural objects. 
um, collapsed and sort of floating in the air through the surgery rooms and a knockdown chamber. The final part uh, takes place in a bingo hall, in a grade two listed bingo hall in the south of London, that used to be a cinema designed to look like a church. So in a way it's a sort of portrait of a building which brings together these three, um, three main ideas in the work, belief, culture and gambling. And in the role of the bingo caller, we, we invited uh, Steve Ignorant from the anarcho-punk band Cross from the late 70s in England. The film The Odds Part 1 is specially produced to be displayed on an LED screen and on top of the image are these pixel animations, individual LEDs that switch on and off and kind of create an effect which is almost between a glitter and a glitch. An LED rash. Almost an LED rash. And with that we really wanted to translate some of the techniques of visual seduction that are developed by the gambling industry and translate those into exhibition strategies. So the other elements in the room you see are the lights, which initially look a little bit like gallery lights, but actually are programmed to work with the animations on the screen and sometimes burst into a much more seductive visual display maybe similar to science that you might encounter in Las Vegas. Now moving on, we see some older work lurking into medical technology that mimics the body and also um, a larger body of work that again was using this X-raying of historical taxidermy. In this case, this series called Heartlines, um, we took colonial taxidermy from the museum in Tervu next to Brussels all of Congolese animals um, and x-rayed them in a local hospital to see the sculptural structures within. Again, sort of asking whether this, these objects presented as natural history are in fact a sculptural, a result of a sculptural practice. We were really interested in how these animals are displayed in what used to be the Africa, the Congo Museum, the museum, currently the Museum of Central Africa. So these taxidermy specimens are displayed in these very elaborate dioramas which are famously modelled after Flemish backdrops, Flemish landscapes. And the taxidermist, because these specimens are so old, the taxidermist might have never seen this animal alive. Uh, it probably would have never seen a leopard hunting an impala and dramatically biting it in the neck. So we were really interested in how these structures are essentially sculptures. They're a product of fantasy, uh, fantasy of the taxidermist. And the other really interesting thing about the Museum for Central Africa is that before its recent renovation, a few years ago, the whole museum had not been remodeled or reorganized or renovated since before 1960, which is the independence of Congo. And therefore generations of children, because it's a very child-friendly museum, so generations of Belgian children, including myself, grew up with an image of Central Africa and of Congo that is still profoundly colonial. Moving upstairs, we cross the bridge to kind of open a new body of work that mostly looks into uh, mass manufacturing, industrial production and supply chains between different parts of the world creating this kind of ecology of products that we are all surrounded by. So the first work around this theme is called Dissolution, I Know Nothing and it is a two-channel video work 
made out of a lot of uh, archival footage, um, some footage that we made on board of a container ship between Hong Kong and Nigeria, and some footage from the archives of Tour's family that was filmed in Congo in the 1960s. Um, and this film is a form of seascape, so to speak, looking into all these connections between the minerals dug out of the ground, the factories in which they are assembled, and the sea that connects them. sometimes think of our practice as a situated practice. That means that we don't just make the work here in our studio, but the work somehow becomes within the world. The work is made within factories in China, mines in Congo, um, and such a situated practice that the process is really important. It's almost as important as whatever comes out of it at the end. It also puts us in the middle of these situations. Um, it makes us complicit within these situations. And that questioning of our own position as an artist when we make these works is something that is really important to us. Um, there is no outside in these vast entanglements that late capitalism presents us with. The next room brings together two really important works in our, in our practice and juxtaposes them. Um, and the first work in this room is 75 Watt, which is a work that we made in 2013. And for 75 Watt, we designed an object specifically to be made in China, in the Pearl River Delta. The object has no function other than to choreograph the laborers in the factory assembling the object. Um, so we produced and designed all of the parts and dimensions specifically to create a certain movement. All of the parts were produced in China, and then we got access to an assembly line in a factory in Zhongshan, near Guangzhou, uh, for five days, and we filmed the dance of the assembly of the object. Across the room is another really important work to us, titled Sterile, also from 2013. And for this work, we have engineered a batch of goldfish to hatch without reproductive organs. And um, the work was a collaboration with a marine biologist called uh, Professor Atsuru Yamaha from the University of Hokkaido in Japan. And um, the reason that we got to Dr. Yamaha is that he was the only person who, could, who works with goldfish, which was very important to us. But um, the question this work revolves around, if an animal is born without the potential of taking part in the reproductive cycle, can we then define it as a biological object, in essence. And it was very inspired by practices of um, animal breeding in which breeders would sell the pure breed animal, whether it's a horse, a dog, a cat. It will normally be first sterilized to protect the breeder's, I guess, copyright or to make sure that you only get the final result and not some kind of potential. Um, so our question was, is sterilization the ritual through which an animal is turned into an object. And if an animal that is born without the reproductive potential can be defined as a biological object. Um, so we spent about six years working with Professor Yamaha in making these fish. After they hatched, they lived with us in our studio in London for many years. We loved them very much. And here you can see uh, one of the remaining bodies. Next to it, there is also a machine, which we made as a kind of homage to Professor Yamaha's process. Um, we call it a sort of dormant choreography of his production process of preparing and producing a fish without reproductive potential. Uh, so in a way, this machine is kind of a reproductive organ for a fish that cannot reproduce. The last element in this room is these drawings. They're blueprints, we often refer to them as retroactive blueprints. Working across a lot of 
media and forums in a lot of situations and locations. We generate a lot of this process material and these blueprints, which we make after we make the work, they combine drawings and sketches and sometimes more souvenirs or anecdotal material from making the project into a cyanotype, which is a process originally used to copy plans, the sort of essentially photocopiers. So another device that we've been using in all of our recent exhibition is those subtitle tracks that run alongside mostly sculptures, not actually video. And these are just a way of bringing some of our text, artist texts that we write, into the exhibition, or in this case, for example, in this room, um, it projects the initial correspondence between myself and Professor Yamaha when I tried to explain to him why we would like him to help us make a goldfish. The last rooms in the exhibition present a series of works around mineral extraction, uh, specifically mineral extraction from Congo. In David van Rijbroek's book on Congo, there's a beautiful paragraph in which he explains that Congo, throughout its history, in some, maybe because of a curse or some blessing, it sort of always had the material that the world desired, often in relation to industrial progress. So when the Victorians were making billiard balls and piano keys out of ivory, there happened to be loads of ivory in Congo. When the inflatable tire was invented, there happened to be loads of rubber in Congo. Uh, it was copper in the height of the Industrial Revolution, uranium at the height of the Cold War. In fact, the atom bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki contained uranium from Katanga, the site of, of Congo, gold, diamond. And the latest in this long list of material is coltan. And coltan is something that we find in all of our devices laptops, smartphones, playstations. Coltan is what tantalum capacitors are made of. And until a few years ago, all of this coltan came from the east of Congo, where it contributes and keeps contributing to the ongoing conflict. So for decades, there's been a violent conflict in the east of Congo, a very unstable region. And coltan, which at times is more expensive per gram than gold, contributes to this conflict. And we were very interested in how, through just using these devices, um, devices that we sometimes think of as virtual, smartphone connections, computer games, through using these devices, in some way, we are all connected continuously to that conflict uh, in the region. The first work in the room is a, from a series of artificial minerals. And um, we've made them as, I, I think, the initial way of kind of digging ourselves back to Congo and finding its traces within all these electronics. So this artificial mineral is made out of aluminium, copper, um, tantalum and gold that were all mined out of um, used hard drives. So the broken electronics around it was what we call the mine. We broke them, took, the took those metals out, dissolved them and recast them as artificial ores. Another work in the room is called Avantu Discipline. Um, they are large theatre voiles on which a landscape is shown. And the landscape is the landscape of a coltan mine in the east of Congo. I took hundreds of photographs the last time I was in this mine landscape. And based on these photographs, we created a 3D model and put it into a game engine, which is a program to make computer games. So this landscape, which we consider the landscape of virtuality because it's where coltan, the material of these virtual connections, comes out of the ground. And this, this, we're presented with this landscape of virtuality. The last work in the exhibition is a film called Trapped in the Dream of the Other that we made in 2017. And this film takes place in the coltan mine in Kivu, east of Congo, in which the camera, um, the camera is within the mine and follows through this man-made landscape as the soil slowly erupts with small explosions. And for the making of the work, we produced our own bespoke fireworks in China and imported them ourselves into Congo, which was quite a stupid thing to do. Um, the fireworks were then detonated, some of them from a distance, using the connection allowed by Coltan, others on site. 
to produce this kind of performance of the soil, a performance of connection and of distance. Thank you so much for tuning in and for your attention. In the format of this artist talk, I was asked to finish with a question. How can we know the dancer from the dance? My name is Yuri. I'm a visual artist and researcher. In the past, I made film installations, contributed to performances, and photographed. How can we know the dancer from the dance? It raises the question if we are in fact aware that we are dancing. Life is a cycle of repetition, movement, acting, and reacting. All activities follow certain codes, a sort of choreography. That is what pushed me to the project Heart and Sweat, where I investigate the choreography of photographing. I developed a camera that connects me with my subject via sensors. The camera can only produce an image if a heart rate crosses. By this intervention, I try to dismantle my photographic practice and at the same time, it visualizes my need for people. As a maker, we are fully intertwined with what we make, but if we are aware that we dance, we need to mutate it once in a while to find new meanings in making. <laughs>